Hi, I'm Josh McGrath. I'm Andrew Haas. And this is the Ardent Pursuit Podcast. Today, we're going to continue our examination of pitfalls that we as men tend to fall into when it comes to pursuing a romantic relationship. And today's episode is titled The Isolation Trap. Andrew, let's dive in here. So what we're really talking about here is relationship-centered isolation. The idea of two people who fall in love, they, they pursue one another romantically, and suddenly their entire world revolves around them. Right. This is just a natural extension of wanting to be with somebody. Mm -hmm. So on one hand, it's, it seems like a natural outcome, yep. but we are suggesting that you should be more intentional about what that looks like. It's, it's funny because there's this natural you know, tension that you have to manage as a guy because the reason you're in that relationship is because you like her. And so obviously you want to spend time with her. And so what men tend to do is suddenly they reorient their entire life around spending time with her. And so they're not only are they texting her all the time, but like they're all their free time, they're spending it with her. Um, and there's like this natural, you know, chemistry, flirtation, excitement, love, whatever you want to call it, where it's like, let's let's be together because it's so much fun for us just to be together. And even like the mundane normal things, like going on a walk, getting coffee, you know, even doing dishes, right? It's like, oh, it's so much more fun when I'm with her. I'm like, ah, get married. That, that'll wear off quickly. Um, but it's this, this thing that men tend to fall into where it's suddenly all about the relationship and community, relationships, even life to some extent are put on the back burner. Because again, there is that natural desire and those are good desires, but the important thing to remember is there is going to be, there should be a notable difference lived out between what you desire and what you actually do. The desire to be with somebody is great, but acting on that desire repeatedly can be problematic. And we talked about this in our last episode that you know once you enter a romantic relationship, everything in your life shouldn't change. Um, and one of the biggest challenges for men is to maintain a vision of investment and involvement in community. Um, in building those relationships with friends and family and not just kind of pulling away and isolating themselves with the woman that they're falling in love with. A really important part of the dating phase and possibly the early dating phase is this idea of delayed gratification. Mm. And it plays out in other areas of life um, to, to good success. Yeah. But in the dating phase especially, delayed gratification is really important. One of the things that makes this even more challenging is the advent of technology because mm -hmm. we have the ability to be in touch with one another uh, at the click of a button. Suddenly, it's not even like a, I have to wait to see you until you're done with work or I have to wait to see you on the weekend. It's literally I can, you know, virtually see you at any moment of the day. Uh, you know, sh show me, send me a picture of your view right now. I'm like, well. And, and what normal environment is anyone doing that? But when you're in a relationship, you're like, here's my view of my cubicle. And it's like, oh, hope you have a good day. It's like no normal person does that until they're in a relationship. And suddenly they're sending pictures of their view to the girl that they are in love with. And in fact, I would even say that technology has made the problem much worse because now you can engage and interact with the person from wherever. Yes. So you can, any environment, any situation, you can interact with them. And whereas before, without constant communication, mm -hmm. there were some more natural barriers. Now those barriers don't exist. Yep. So without the self-restraint to not engage with that person whenever, wherever, mm -hmm. there is just the ability to do it. And too often, we just don't have any, any good boundaries around what's appropriate. It's true because you can still technically be in community, hanging out with friends or family or whatever, but be completely focused on her via the device in your hand. And so while you're looking like you're involved and invested, you actually are because you're actually completely distracted by communicating with her. You know, oh, I wish you were here. This would be so much more fun if you were here, you know? Um, and that actually becomes really unhealthy because 
then for friends and family, relationships around you, and we're going to get into this and unpack it shortly, what you begin to do is push them out of your life and it isolates you and leaves you actually very much alone without the guardrails, without the feedback, without the counsel that really you need for your relationship to be successful. And I'll say that some of the cringiest moments of my early dating time was when I was present with my college friends mm. and was not present with them. Yep. I had a flip phone at the time. Come on. I thought I was so cool. <laughs> and there was this girl I really liked. And hey, I had an unlimited texting plan. Yep. So I'm just going to text her all the time. And looking back, it was like just awkward and mm -hmm. cringy. Mm -hmm. In the moment, I didn't see it. Yeah. I'm like, I love texting this girl. Yeah. But... I was present, well, I was physically present with friends, yep. but I just wasn't there. Mm -hmm. My mind was like on my flip phone yep. and waiting for that her to reply. It's interesting because when you're in the moment of, you know, being in love and, and focused on her, you're not aware of the perception of what that looks like. Mm -hmm. And, you know, having witnessed, you know, at this point, I don't know, hundreds of relationships, um, having walked with dozens of men through their relationships, it is from an outsider's perspective, incredibly cringy. And it's like, bro, like man up, put the phone away. You can go two hours without texting her. It's like, dude, where's like, your, like, come on, grow up. It's and it's okay. <laughs> And it, yeah, and it's nuanced and, and it's subtle, but it's there. There's just something that's it's really hard to walk forward as a guy mm -hmm. in in your say masculine identity when you're constantly trying to engage and satisfy this like emotional desire. Mm -hmm. You know, it felt good. I loved those moments in the moment. Sure, it felt good. Yep, but it wasn't actually moving me to a place with her, with my education, mm -hmm. with my social environment. It wasn't actually moving me to a place that was helpful or beneficial. And this is why a lot of men don't have authority and accountability in their lives because they don't want to receive correction with regards to the focus of time and energy on the woman. Like you said, it, it does feel good. It is very satisfying. It's very gratifying. Uh, but we've advocated from day one the value and importance of having authority and accountability is so that you are set up for the greatest possible success in your romantic relationship and, and, and hopefully ultimately one day marriage. Um, the goal isn't to say spending time together is bad. Never do that. You know, we're not anti spending time together. Um, what we're anti is you cutting out community, cutting out authority and accountability, cutting out family so that you can just spend time alone together. One of the most challenging things, in my opinion, uh, for people to reckon with, specifically guys, is getting between a guy and something he wants. Mm. Men can have these intense desires and yeah. drives, yep. which are good. They move culture and society forward in a lot of ways. Um, and when a guy wants something, he can often be very determined. Yeah. And if something gets in between that, it, it can be really hard for the guy to reckon with that. Mm -hmm. And so it's really good for men to practice not satisfying every desire. Yeah, Time will come for that eventually, but in the dating phase, it's going to be really important for men to recognize there are things, there are feelings that I have, there are desires that I have, mm -hmm. there are going to be things that I want yep. really badly, Yeah, but not fulfilling that is actually the better choice. And... It's probably one out of a million, maybe a billion men who can do that without authority and accountability in their lives. Mm -hmm. I, I think before we begin a relationship, we as men tend to be very self-assured and self-confident on, I can walk this out well. I, I know how to do it. I know what the proper you know things are. I know what the proper boundaries are. I'm going to do it and it's going to be awesome and I'm going to be successful. And then we get like two hours into a romantic relationship and and all boundaries have been crossed. And we're like, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, and this is why men need authority and accountability is because once they begin to pursue a woman romantically, I don't care how self-assured the guy is, 
history and statistics and biology are not on your side. They are not. You you are headed towards, unfortunately, some self-destructive uh, patterns and habits just out of a, a desire to be with her, to please her, to make her happy, to make you happy, to satisfy your own wants and needs. And so to set you up, to set her up, to set the relationship up for success, what do you do? You set up some guardrails in your life. Yes, don't ignore your friends. And specifically, what I mean by that is, if they give you input mm -hmm. or feedback, it's so easy, I would say for guys in particular, um, possibly for women, but it's so easy for men to just ignore that feedback. And you'll do so to your peril. Yep. It's really easy to assume that people are excited for you simply because they don't come to you and say, hey, I've got concerns. Um, and I don't think that men should just assume everyone is excited about the relationship. Mm -hmm. um, they should be interested in finding out what do people think about my pursuit of this woman. Um, and we've talked about this in earlier episodes where like part of kind of how you prepare to even pursue a romantic relationship is by going to your authority and your accountability, by inviting in outside counsel into that process. Um, but sometimes we as men don't do that. And so don't ignore their thoughts and opinions simply because you haven't asked them. Go and ask them. And if they're not excited for you, find out why. Don't, don't just write them off and be like, well, you know nothing. Yes, when you, when you go and ask what you need to do, do not get defensive. And I think that is a big hang up for, in my experience and what I've seen time and again, um, getting defensive is a cancer. And when you get defensive about someone giving you feedback, um, it just shows, well, it just shows that you're closed off mm -hmm. and not truly willing or able to hear something that you might not want to hear. Yes, and that's why for so many men, they do just end up isolating themselves. And Proverbs 18, one talks about, you know, one who, you know, it says here, one who separates himself seeks his own desire. He quarrels against sound judgments. Mm -hmm. How often do men really quarrel with sound judgment? You know, uh, authority, accountability, a friend, a parent, whatever, a sibling comes to, to them and says, hey, I'm concerned about the fact that you're spending so much time alone with this woman and they're suddenly so defensive and ready to get into a fight and defend why they're spending all this time with her yeah or why it's not a big deal why it's, yeah they try to justify it try to give their own excuses and it's like yeah you're, you're quarreling with some sound judgment here mm -hmm. um people in your life generally don't have it out to see your relational demise for the most part mm -hmm. the vast majority of us come from a community and families where people don't want to see our imminent demise when it comes to a romantic relationship. So if they're coming to you with some type of feedback or concerns, mm -hmm. don't write that off and be like, well, you're just trying to ruin my relationship or you're just trying to ruin life or, or you're just being so, I, I don't know, uh, you know, conservative or strict. Be open and willing to receive that feedback because chances are the reason that's being shared is because they actually love you and care about you. And over time, concerns will be validated or not. Mm -hmm. um, sure, there could be a one-off concern. Um, but if it's real, if it's there, it will bear out with other people. Sure. Generally. And so as you ask around, um, you know, if someone brings a concern, offer that concern to other people. Say, hey, so-and-so mentioned they saw this. Mm -hmm. You know, what do you think? And you'll have an opportunity to have other people validate or not yeah and through that process you'll learn okay what are what am i dealing with men should not be so prideful and haughty as to assume that they're conducting their relationship in such a perfect way that no one could or should have a concern mm -hmm. like i'm sorry no man has conducted a relationship that perfectly there will be a concern at some point raised by someone Mm -hmm. And you don't need to get all defensive when that happens. You as a man, the mark of a mature and healthy man is he's able to receive feedback and even criticism and to process that in a way where he's able to apply the truth and re reject the falsehood. Um, maybe every concern and every criticism isn't actually valid and true. 
but a healthy and mature man is going to be able to mine for the gold of what he can apply and throw out the rest. Um, and there is probably no woman that is so perfect that somewhere along the way, someone won't see something in her and be concerned for you and therefore bring it to your attention. It's not an attack on her. It's not to vilify her. It's out of concern for you. And look, when you're in the the the, the love stage of a relationship, the honeymoon phase of a relationship, yeah, she's going to seem perfect and everything that she does is just the cutest. And, it, you know... <laughs> There's this uh, uh, scene from Parks and Rec where Andy and April, uh, I don't remember if this is after they're married or before they're married, but they're, they're living together um, and they, they have Ben move in with them. Um, and Ben's like their roommate. And so they're eating, he comes out one morning of his room and they're eating chili out of a Frisbee with a spoon and sharing the spoon because they don't have any dishes. <laughs> And, and Ben is like, are, are you guys eating chili out of a Frisbee? And, and uh, Andy, you know, Chris Pratt's character is last. He's like, yeah, it's cute, right? And he's like, I, I, I don't think you know what cute, you know, what does Ben say? Do you know what cute means? Like, it's just so funny. Like the most like weird, obnoxious, you know, characteristics of a person when you're in that honeymoon, I love them phase are like all super cute to you. Whereas to the rest of humanity, it's mm-hmm. like maybe a concern. So if someone brings that concern to you, again, it's not an attack on her. Right. It, it's an opportunity for you to recognize, oh, I, I'm seeing everything about her with rose-colored glasses. Mm-hmm. And at some point, either just through maturity and accountability and authority and people in my life helping to take those off, they're going right. to come off or they're going to come off just through longevity of relationship with her. And what a guy will want to do, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, bringing up concerns and, you know, not being defensive, willing to hear whether the concern is real or not. The ability to hear it, I think, is, is, a, is an important mark of a man. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're not talking about, you know, break up and the relationship. Sure. You know, some could be, but more often it's someone might see something that you could be doing better. Mm-hmm. And what we're advocating for is, hey, let's do this to the best of our ability. Let's do this with excellence. So someone could see something, and if they say something to you, just take it as like, oh, yeah, I can probably do this better. Yeah. Not, oh, man, they want us to break up. We need to, you know, they, they don't know. Exactly. So don't, you know, you don't want to approach it as like this black and white. It's more of a, you know, what are people observing, mm-hmm. and what could I do better? Yes. So how do you avoid the trap of falling into just total relationship-centric isolation? You know, I I think that what comes to mind right away is this idea of uh, you've got to be aware of it. Mm -hmm. I I think a lot of people just assume that culturally that's what comes with being in a relationship, Um, which, as we talked about in the last episode, we kind of debunked that myth that just because you're now in a relationship, everything actually doesn't need to change. You, You don't go from I'm part of a community and friends and family and, you know, normal life to my entire world and life is her because we've started a relationship. Um, that That is a massive extreme shift. Um, and so you've got to be aware as a man that there's a tendency to want to do that before you can even try to prevent yourself from falling into that trap. Yeah, your desires will shift. And sure, the desire might not exist today. But if you start walking down that road, desires and motivations are going to change. Yeah. And so just recognize that's a real thing. It's going to happen. Um and so, you know, what safeguards can be set up to help navigate that better? Yeah, so I think that today we're going to identify four. I'm sure there's plenty of others out mm-hmm. there, but we're going to keep it simple with four. Um, and I'm sure our listeners can't even guess what number one is because it's going to be so hard to know based upon everything we've said in the past. But number one, you need to have authority and accountability involved in your life Mm -hmm. because it's through authority and accountability that you're going to probably receive the best, most objective feedback to help safeguard you from falling into the trap of isolating yourselves. And this is something that guys will need to be aware of. You know, I've, I've seen this play out where someone will say, um, you know, a guy will be dating and he'll say, yeah, there's this pastor um, mm. you know, two states over or in my old hometown. Yeah. He knows me well. You know, I call him twice a month and we chat yep. and he, you know, keeps me accountable. Mm-hmm. And that's not what we're talking about. Nope. Um, not at all. And it's got to be someone 
like in your daily life, mm -hmm. more or less. Mm -hmm. um, someone you live life with, someone who can see you in person. Yep. Um, now there's lots of lots of wisdom to be had by people who know us who may be across the country. Of course. Sure. Facilitate feedback from them. It can yep. be very helpful. Mm -hmm. But specifically here, it's going to have to be someone that you, that sees you and knows you. Yeah. We talked about this in depth in episode six. And one of the things we talked about, just for simplicity's sake, defining authority as you know parents and pastors. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen this played out in many men's lives where they have moved out of their parents' house. They've moved you know either multiple hours away or multiple states away. Um, and they're meeting with me and I'm asking them, you know, who's the authority in your life that you're processing, you know, this relationship with? And they'll say, oh, well, my parents. And I'm like, but you don't live with your parents. You haven't lived with your parents for years. They're, they're hours or states away. Um, like, I'm so glad they're involved and absolutely they should be involved. Um, but they're not seeing you on a regular basis. They don't know your life here like other people do. And so it is so important that men don't try to placate, mm -hmm. you know, the 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 recommendation of having authority and accountability in their life by picking people, you know, strategically who don't really know them, who don't really see them, who don't who can't really speak into their life, so that it, they have that sense of, well, I've got authority and accountability, but in reality, they they don't. Um, and and I think for men, this is something that we tend to fall into. Mm -hmm. um, it's, we 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 want the the ability to tell people, oh yeah, you know, particularly as Christian men, oh yeah, I've got authority and accountability because I know that's good for me, and we you know we can pat ourselves on the back and feel good. Mm -hmm. When in reality, the people we've picked to be our authority and accountability are, aren't people who really know us. They're not people who are really in our lives. They're people we barely see, and they're people who don't ask hard questions. And so they're just like, hey, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Oh, that's awesome. All right, mm -hmm. well, let's uh, well, let's go watch a movie now. And it's like, boom, that was my authority and accountability. And it's like, well, that's. That's not authority and accountability. And one of the one of the fundamental problems with I'll just touch on this, you know, authority whom who's you know a few states away. Um, give that example. Uh, the fundamental problem there is even if they know you well, you they only are going off of what you tell them. Yep. So they are going to have they're starting off with an incomplete picture. Sure. They only have what you are telling them. Yep. And that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Not only that, so they give you feedback. Um, you may or may not adhere to it. Yep. Um, and there's just, when someone is removed from your environment, there is just an easier, t um, when someone is removed from your environment, it's just a little easier to, say, stretch the truth or sure. tell a partial truth. Or make yourself look out, look to be in the best light possible. Mm-hmm. And long term, there's just not good fruit there. Mm -hmm. One of the things that men need to also be aware of when it comes to, you know, kind of authority and accountability is to not confuse the responses of things like, you know, good for you or, or that's exciting as affirmative, we support this. Mm -hmm. You know, I think generally my default response when someone comes and tells me, they're in a relationship. You know, this is, you know, they're not asking my opinion. They're just telling me they're in a relationship. My general response is, that's exciting because it is. Ooh, like, I want mm -hmm. to be excited for you that you're in a relationship. Now, if that man never asks, what do you think? Mm -hmm. It could be very easy for him to assume my response of, that's exciting is, I love that you're in a relationship and I fully support that you're in this relationship at this time with this woman and that the way you're conducting it is awesome. Especially if that is the, you know, if that's the feedback, you know, as they go around yes. to multiple people and they hear from everybody, oh, wow, so exciting. Mm -hmm. Oh, so exciting. Oh, that's great. It's like, yeah, that's a, that's a polite, friendly way to just acknowledge yes. it. And in general, healthy people don't just go around stating all the things that they're concerned about when someone comes to them with some, you know, exciting news. Yes. You know, maybe over the course of time, they might begin to share it, but almost always that sharing will only happen at the invitation of somebody saying, what do you think? As the guy, it is your responsibility to open that door. You've got to go to people and say, hey, what do you think? Yeah. And ideally, you're asking that question before you've even gone and pursued her. Um, you know, there was a, a woman several years ago who I was interested in. Um, 
And before pursuing her, I sat down with a whole bunch of people to ask what they thought about me pursuing her and in that season of life. Um, I know I sat down with you and your wife. Um, I sat down with a whole bunch of people and was just like, what do you think? Like, I, I'm not emotionally invested in this yet. Um, I'm interested. I, I, I've thought about it. Um, I want to move in this direction. Mm -hmm. But before I've even asked her, I want you to have the opportunity to say, hey, we don't think her or we don't think now. Um, and that was so validating that after going to everybody and, you know, my parents included, pastors included, that everyone was like, thumbs up, absolutely go and do that. It was very, uh, uh, like, I felt so, like, confident going and having a conversation with her because I was like, I know that everyone is saying this is a good thing. Versus asking her, her saying yes, then me coming back to everybody and be like, I'm in a relationship. Well, what do you think? Well, that's a lot harder. It's, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, someone someone buys a, a house, right? And they don't ask anyone about it. And then they invite you over and they're like, well, what do you think? And you're like, this is a really ugly house. <laughs> like, like, why would you ever buy this? Like, that's the wrong time to give an honest mm -hmm. opinion. You're like, you know, it's fun. A lot of potential. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're, you're, you're recalibrating exactly. what you would say versus when you're first walking through it with somebody and they're like, what do you think? It's a lot easier to be honest. Way easier. In the same way, it's so much easier to be honest with a guy who comes to you before he's pursued her mm -hmm. and is asking, what do you think? Versus him coming to you with her and being like, what do you think? I'm like, hi, nice to meet you. This is exciting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's going to be my response. <laughs> and the second safeguard that we recommend is it's going to serve you well to spend all or most of your time in the dating phase with other people. That's a controversial statement. Again, it goes to delay gratification, Yep, and it is controversial. But what about the classic response that someone would say of, but I've got to get to know her. We've got to get to know each other. People buy into the lie that to truly get to know somebody, you've got to spend one-on-one -on -one time with them. Mm. And there's just simply no truth in that. Yeah. You really only get to know somebody in watching them and, and interacting with them in a wide variety of situations. And when you're just one-on-one -on -one with somebody, it's like, yeah, they're going to put on their, their best face. Yep. They're going to put on their best mannerisms. Mm -hmm. They have no other responsibilities, nothing else to pay attention to. Yep. They only have you, and so they're going to give you their best. And that's not who they are. Mm -hmm. And if the person that you want to pursue is unwilling to spend time in a community setting with others... That's not somebody you should be pursuing. Someone who's who's saying, no, your attention, affection, time, and energy needs to solely be on me is a, an unhealthy individual. Um, and that, in a marriage context, it is going to be very, very challenging. Um, and so you do want to develop a relationship that is built upon the premise of it's not about us, but it's actually about other people. It's about the community and looking for opportunities to serve others. Because ultimately, in marriage, there is a lot of one-on-one -on -one time, mm -hmm. and there should be a lot of one-on-one -on -one time. But marriage fundamentally is about serving the other person. And if you're starting out the dating phase not thinking about how can I serve this person yep. or how can I serve others, if that's not your default approach, it's going to be that much harder to make that the approach in marriage. Mm -hmm, definitely. There's this great quote by Francis Chan. He says this, quote, Don't isolate yourselves. Instead, find ways to grow your relationship through serving others and being a part of a larger community, end quote. And I think that is such a great summation of what a relationship, a romantic relationship should entail. It, it shouldn't just be about you two. Um, in the modern Western world of relationships, relationships are very individualistic. It's very much, you know, just the, the couple. Mm -hmm. But when you get outside of the Western context of relationships, historically, romantic relationships were very much a community thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, particularly if you go to something like the Jewish culture, the Muslim culture today, right? A lot of African cultures have this. Um, some Hispanic cultures have this. Uh, Asian cultures, where like when two people enter into this, it's it's a big deal. Where it's like a community mm -hmm. event that's happening, and that's why in a lot of these cultures, the wedding isn't just a single day. 
uh, it's actually multiple days or, or even a week or so. Um, I know that like in Indian culture, that's very popular. Um, and so in this modern Western world, we're very much like, oh, it's just us and we're just so happy with each other and our entire world is each other. Not realizing that, well, that's a very unhealthy perspective of what a relationship is. A relationship should be outward focused, not inward focused. Yeah, while it feels good to have that one-on-one -on -one time and that engagement alone with somebody, even in a crowd, mm -hmm. long-term, what actually is gonna make a good marriage is somebody being able to spend time away from you and being able to engage and interact. And so if you're practicing just the two of us talking without other people, and then you're expecting it to switch mm -hmm. later, it's like you got to practice now what actually is good, what are good habits later. Exactly. Yeah. If, if you don't like the harvest you're reaping, look at the seed you've been planting. And so if the seed you've been planting is one of just us, guess what harvest you're not going to reap? One of community. Um, so I think about safeguard number three here that we, we've titled, Resist the Temptation to Make It All About You Guys. Now, this kind of builds off of safeguard number two, but in a slightly, slightly different mm. way. This is where you recognize the importance or value of being in a community setting, you know, with your friends, with family. Um, maybe uh, it's expected or dictated of you that you are going to spend time in a community setting. Don't know how you ended up there, but you're there. But then, even though you're in a community setting, it's all about you guys. Um, I, and I think about just some classic examples that, you know, I've not only witnessed in life, but you see in movies and TV shows. Uh, it's the, we're all in a group together, you know, at some social event, maybe church, maybe you know, an outing. And it's the two of them just talking together the entire time. And it's like, there's mm. this whole group here, but there's, and then there's them. Mm -hmm. And it's like, they're technically in a community setting, mm -hmm. but it's very obvious it's just them. Oh, you know what it's like? Say, you know, you want to eat healthy. I think it's a good food analogy. And you're like, all right, I'm going to eat organic. And so you go down to the cereal aisle and, you know, you can find an organic cinnamon toast crunch. Mm. Um, you can find organic Fruit Loops or, you know, there are organic versions sure. of these cereals that you're like, all right, you're not fooling anybody. Yeah. The label says one thing, but come on, we know. We know what you really want. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, I think about things like your know, dinner parties. Group of people are having dinner. Maybe they go out to a restaurant. And there's the two of you at the very end, just chatting it up, staring at each other, giggling, whispering. It's like you're having your own you know, sub-conversation apart from the entire table. Mm -hmm. um, or you're going, you know, you're all walking. I don't know where people walk these days, not malls. Um, but like you're, you're walking somewhere as a group and it's like the two of you have trailed way off into the back. You're the, you're the caboose way far away mm -hmm. so that you can spend time alone together. And so it's like, I'm technically fulfilling being part of a community, but you're not. You're really making it all about you. And the thing about that is it creates a weird dynamic within the community where I've had friends do this before, where suddenly it's like a burden to have them part of the group because you're like, they're not actually here. They actually don't want to hang out. And when they do come, it's all about them. And it just is kind of like, ugh, gross. Like, guys, like, just get a room or something. Like, you clearly don't want to be here. Um, and so it begins to really put a attention on established relationships. Mm -hmm. And instead of people maybe being excited for you, and celebrating you in your dating season, they're actually like, ugh, just get married. Like, be done with this. Let's mm -hmm. get this over with. Because we don't want to have to witness this. Like, we want you to be a normal person again. Yeah, and I think a good, a good rule of thumb, uh, you know, it's probably controversial, and I think we've been, been touched on this in the past, but a good rule of thumb is, you know, if an outsider comes into your social mm -hmm. circles for the first time, doesn't know anybody, doesn't know anything. If someone could quickly figure out that you're dating yeah. with a high level of confidence, that they could say like, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure they're dating. Mm -hmm. If that can be quickly determined, yeah. I suggest you're doing something wrong. My recommendation, what I think is actually best, is to make it as hard as possible for an uninformed outsider to actually know you're dating. Mm. There are obviously 
conditions with that. Sure, of course. Um, this isn't just ignore the other person. Yep. Um, but instead of leaning toward making it obvious that we're dating, my suggestion, I think what's actually better is err toward the side of we're going to interact with other people, with each other, in a way where it's actually hard to tell if we're dating. Mm -hmm. Sure, we're friends, um, and we might have feelings, but not making those feelings readily apparent, mm -hmm. I think is really important. And extremely challenging. It takes a lot of intentionality. Um, it takes a lot of maturity. And it takes a lot of self-control. Um, because the very nature of a romantic relationship is one where you want to express yourself through, you know, conversation, through physical touch, through your interaction with the other person in a way that really demonstrates what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, I think it was last episode we joked about, you know, go write a sonnet, go write a symphony, go, you know, paint a painting, you know, express it in a different way because those feelings should be there. Yes. If they're not there, don't be in a relationship. That just because those feelings are there doesn't mean you need to act on them in mm -hmm. certain ways. And number four, don't be defensive. Defensiveness is a cancer and it's not going to serve you. It's not going to serve your friends well. It is, um, it is a problem, full stop. Mm -hmm. And again, as a man, you like this woman. You love this woman. You want to pursue her. There's, there is a sexual drive even towards her. So it gets really hard to receive feedback that either slows down that process mm -hmm. or curtails the, the activities around that process in certain ways. And you're like, it goes against everything you want as a man in that moment. And that's where men tend to become very defensive. They try to justify, make excuses, and, and defend themselves and their actions and their feelings and whatever else. Again, the mark of a mature and healthy man is he's able to receive that feedback mm -hmm. and be able to apply that which is true, that which is good, that which is helpful in order why to set himself up for the greatest possible success. And, and we could even say, you know, we could be charitable and say someone comes to you with a concern even if they're wrong, not being defensive, mm -hmm. which that would even be an opportunity to be defensive. Yes. Even if they're wrong, not being defensive there is going to serve you well. And so there really is no situation mm -hmm. where it's appropriate. Um, best case, it'll, best case, there's nothing. Yeah. But I would suggest that that's not even unlikely. Um, if you're defensive, it will always have poor outcomes. It will. And one of the things that I found in my own life uh, over years of uh, having people come and you know bring things to my attention and or just outright correct me, uh, is that in the moment, almost always, I, I want to say something. I can feel myself wanting to defend or justify mm -hmm. or give an explanation for that. And in very rare cases, will that be needed? And so in those moments where I find those feelings and those thoughts beginning to rise up, I purpose in my heart and then I make sure I verbally state it. Thank you for bringing this to my attention. I'm going to process it. Because what that does is instead of me saying, defending whatever else, my position, I, I know that I need a moment to process what they're saying because sinful, broken Josh wants to prove that he's right. He didn't do anything wrong and he's basically perfect. But I know that's probably not true, but I'm like in a defensive posture. So I'm not going to think well about this right here. I need to go and process that. And I also recognize that from their perspective, it's very hard for most people, not everyone, but for most people to bring a concern or mm -hmm. correction to someone that they love and care about. Yeah. And so by, by saying something like, thank you, first of all, I'm, I'm recognizing the difficulty that it can be for them to correct me or bring that to my attention. But then by saying, I'll process it, mm -hmm. it, it, it I don't have to have a, have a big, long discussion there. And I will go and process it. And I'll go to my authority and accountability. And I will bring it to their attention and say, hey, here's something that was brought to me. What do you guys think? You know, it's so important for men in particular to be good at and to be well practiced in receiving input, receiving feedback, even criticism, mm -hmm. and not giving any pushback, no defensiveness, no explanation, just listen. Yeah. And too often, especially in, in dating, we want to explain why. We want to give reasons. We want to 
you know, give our side of the story. And there may come a time for that. Mm -hmm. But men need to practice and be well-versed in just listening and whether it's right or wrong. You know, that, that, will, that will show itself to be true in time, mm-hmm. whether it's right or wrong. But the guy needs to practice, I'm just going to listen, I'm going to take it in, and I'm not going to be defensive. Yeah, you know, Proverbs talks about how iron sharpens iron, so one man's countenance does another. And really, it's through that process of friction, you know, iron against iron, that there's a sharpening. And so if we as men are never in an environment where there's friction, we're actually never becoming better as men. It is through friction, through people challenging us, through people coming to us, that we're going to grow and be better men. Um, And so we should not look at someone bringing concerns or challenging us, even when it comes to relationships, as a bad thing, as something to be avoided. We should actually welcome that and receive that because that's an opportunity for us to grow. It's an opportunity to become a better man. And any man who doesn't want to become a better man is a man who should not be in a relationship. And it's a really good time to realize, you know, good or bad, I'm going to be better off either way. Yep. Avoiding something, avoiding adversity, avoid, mm-hmm. avoiding hardship, that doesn't actually improve anything. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and so even if you are doing things well, being able to navigate that in an environment where people might have different opinions, mm-hmm. hey, so what? You'll still be better off. Definitely. So as we conclude here, um, for those of you who are in a relationship, uh, if you have found yourself isolating and making it all about you two, you need to, this week, figure out a plan on how to reverse course and how to, once again, make your relationship about community and about investing and serving others. One of the best ways to discover whether you've been doing this is to ding, 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 go to your authority and accountability and ask their honest opinion on whether you've been uh, you know, focusing your time, energy, and resources mostly on each other or on others. And for those of you who are not in a relationship but hope to be someday, it's never too early to begin habits that will set yourself up for success in the future. So make sure you're in a community, make sure you're establishing friendships with men, with women, with older generations, with younger generations, and make sure you have authority and accountability in your life. Go and set that up. We've talked about that, I don't know, like two dozen times at this point. Um, make sure that's established in your life before you begin a relationship. As always, we love having you guys here. We also love hearing your feedback, comments, and so absolutely reach out to us at contact at ardentpursuit.fm or drop a comment on any of our social media platforms, and we'll see you here next time.